Today I'm going to give this talk on sarcopenia, which is a topic that um, I find that most physicians and internists who really should be familiar with it are not super familiar with it. Most of you guys can recognize somebody who's cachectic, right? But that's like, like total end stage, like it's practically too late for a lot of those people. Uh, but there's a lot more nuance to the topic and things that are worth understanding and being able to identify in practice because we see so much of it, even if we don't explicitly recognize it. So, sarcopenia, uh, the word comes from Greek roots for poverty of flesh, meaning you have a loss of muscle mass and consequent to that you have a loss of muscle function as well. And so there's been an increasing interest in this in the research literature. Um, there's been a bunch of working groups that have come up around the world, particularly the most prominent one is the European working group on sarcopenia in older people. And they came up, uh, most recently they met in 2018, and they came up with these kind of uh, criteria where they said if somebody has low muscle strength, they probably have sarcopenia. If, they, if you confirm that with low muscle quantity in terms of a mass assessment, for example, using DEXA scanning, you can confirm the diagnosis of sarcopenia. And if they have low physical performance based on a certain validated uh, kind of physical tests that you can have the patient do, then that would, would uh, suggest severe sarcopenia is present. And so kind of like how we think about heart failure as an organic disease, you have chronic heart failure, for example, or chronic kidney disease. Uh, these organizations now view skeletal muscle as, a, as an organ in and of itself. And sarcopenia would be the equivalent of like chronic heart failure is this chronic muscle failure, so to speak. And so these kind of, uh, these data are important to be aware of that inactive adults, they lose three to 8% of their muscle mass per decade after age 30. So if anybody in here is already over 30, you can start thinking about that if you're inactive writing your progress notes every day, right? And this process accelerates after the age of 50 to the point where you lose almost half of your muscle mass by the time you're 80 between this period of time. That is should be scary to anybody who is inactive and should be scary to us who are taking care of patients who are inactive. And so whereas we may have a young, healthy male who may have upwards of 50 kilos or more of muscle mass on his body, you all have seen a frail little old lady who has less than 10 or 12 kilos of muscle mass on her, just skin and bones, right? And you guys intuitively know that that carries a worse prognosis independent of any other medical condition that they may have. And so back in 2000, there was some, uh, some uh, public health data that was uh, compiled, and, and they estimated that the cost attributable to sarcopenia alone during that year was $18 billion in the U.S. Do you think this has gotten better or worse since then? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as a society, it's not like people just started getting up and you know getting super jacked since then, right? <laughs> so why should you guys care about this condition in particular? Well, here is some data that most physicians are not aware of, that we have... Over 23 studies, as listed here, that are correlating validated metrics of strength, either hand grip strength or knee extension strength, with mortality. And this is across multiple uh, cohorts, age, sex, medical, comor comorbidity status. Um, and this is stuff that most of us are not particularly aware of. So ranging from young people, where this study of over 1.1 million adolescents in Sweden prospectively followed them over almost 25 years, and they found that those who had the highest hand grip strength or the highest knee extension strength had upwards of 35% lower risk of all-cause mortality. Look, looking further in life to old folks, we have abundant data. This is just one that I randomly picked out of the bunch where they looked at this group of five, over 500 men and women at age 85, and then they looked at them again at age 89. They found that those who were in the lowest third of strength metrics, the hand grip strength at age, eight, at age 85, had this 35% increase in all-cause mortality. Those who had the lowest grip strength at 89 had over 100% increase. Not only that, but those who had the greatest hand grip strength decline also had this dramatic increase in mortality. So those who had the sleep, steepest decline in their strength over that period of time, which again, you all know intuitively, is gonna be a bad prognostic factor. I'm just pointing it out explicitly here. And in fact, it appeared that hand grip strength had an even higher impact on mortality than their age alone, greater than the fact that they were just 89 years old and likely to die anyway at that point, right? So how does this work? This is one of my favorite papers on the topic and the caption to this diagram is amusingly labeled a simplified diagram of the mechanisms of kind of muscle mass accretion and atrophy. So to simplify it for you all, I'll have these criteria, and this is when I'm talking to residents and lecturing about this, these are the, this is like the, the take home points, the thing to understand the most, is that we have the amount of skeletal muscle mass that you carry at any given time is gonna be the balance between muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. Kind of like you think about maybe steady state creatinines, right? Being the balance between 
how much is being created, how much is being excreted, you get that steady state uh, balance. Same with skeletal muscle mass. So things that promote muscle protein synthesis to increase skeletal muscle mass, you guys know, muscle contraction, for example, something that you might associate with people who lift weights, dietary protein intake, and then various hormones and growth factors, IGF-1, certain other, uh, certain other signaling molecules throughout the body. The catabolic stimuli side, you can see the opposite of the first two. So instead of muscle contraction, inactivity, muscular unloading, bed rest, being in the hospital for two weeks or more, inadequate dietary protein, so consuming a relatively low protein diet or protein insufficient diet, for example, like when you're in the hospital, Infl inflammation or oxidative stress, for example, when you're in the hospital with sepsis or some infectious process or some chronic disease, COPD, heart failure, CKD, cirrhosis, cancer, all of these are chronic inflammatory states. Chronic hypoxia, for example, like when you have pneumonia or when you have uh, COPD and you're in the hospital, and glucocorticoids, for example, like when you're in the hospital. So you see that, for example, your typical admission for an acute exacerbation of COPD checks probably five out of five factors up there, right? That's not a good situation for retention of muscle mass, retain, retention of their physical function, uh, and that's worth noticing. So the other important concept to understand from this talk, besides those anabolic and catabolic stimuli, is this anabolic resistance. So you guys are familiar with concepts of insulin resistance, for example, right? Uh, sensitivity resistance spectrum, where in order to overcome a certain amount of insulin resistance, what do you have to do? You have to increase the dose of insulin that you're giving this individual to overcome that to achieve the same physiologic effect. Now, anabolic resistance is the same kind of concept where individuals may be resistant to a given anabolic stimulus. So for example, the dietary protein, if you give a young healthy person a dose of say about 0.2 grams per kilo of dietary protein in a given meal, like what you just ate right now, that'll maximize the muscle, their muscle protein synthetic response. If you give that same dose to somebody who is older, to somebody who is less active, or to somebody who is sick, you will see no muscle protein synthetic response from that. They do not respond to that. However, if you double that dose, for example, and take it up to 0.4 grams per kilo in a given meal, you see a maximum response, just like you see in the younger individual. So this is important to understand because a lot of people in society, in the public, in the media, you'll hear them say, you know, who, who do you think would need a greater dose of dietary protein, the young, healthy, hard-charging athlete or the old, frail, sick person? Most people will be like, oh, the athlete needs more protein because he's doing all this stuff. It's actually the exact reverse of that. The young person is super, super sensitive to the effects of dietary protein. It doesn't even take all that much for them to get the maximum anabolic response out of it. You give that same dose to an older person, you see nothing, okay? So they need more. The same thing applies to the training stimulus. A young person might do two sets of an exercise and get a maximum anabolic response. With the older person, they may not get anything out of that. And this has also been studied in literature as well. So basically, anabolic resistance you can see these are things that we see a lot in the hospitalized setting or in your primary care clinics, patients who meet all of these criteria. And so you have to think about that when you're dosing your interventions for this kind of thing. So the problem that we see with sarcopenia is net catabolism or muscle protein breakdown chronically outweighs muscle protein synthesis. And this, on this side, is even made even worse by the phenomenon of anabolic resistance. So whatever anabolic stimuli they're getting are often underdosed, meaning they're not getting much out of it. So when the catabolism outpaces it, you get net loss of muscle mass and you end up with all these consequences. So you guys day to day, you're like, okay, what does this really mean to me in the hospital if you're not convinced yet? We have tons of, liter tons of literature and tons of data on this. For example, grip strength predicting hospitalization. That's something that is worth noting. Not only that, but it's uh, predicting mortality while they're inpatient, predicting readmission, which is something that everybody is supposed to care about now, right? So this stuff matters quite a bit. Here are some of the graphs from that latter paper where we see readmission rates between those who are sarcopenic in the dashed and non-sarcopenic in the solid, as well as survival rates, the bottom dashed in the sarcopenic individuals, the solid lines in those who are non-sarcopenic. That kind of makes the case itself right there, right? You all are also probably familiar with how having high creatinine is generally not the best sign, right? You guys are readily identified, oh yes, this patient's creatinine is 1.9 or 2.5 or something like that, something going on either acutely or chronically, and, I, and I'm, I'm not okay with this condition. Less frequently do we notice the opposite side of this curve where mortality goes up with lower serum creatinines. And this is something that you all 
hopefully, hopefully will remember, will correlate with the amount of skeletal muscle mass that somebody is carrying. So a creatinine down below, this is, uh, this is below 0.5 for women as you get down to 0.4 or below, and then a little bit higher because males naturally tend to carry a little bit more lean body mass. Once they get below 0.7, you see 0.5s. Most people in here would see a male with a creatinine of 0.5 and you wouldn't think twice about it, right? You're like, yeah, perfect, great. I can give them all the antibiotic dosing that I want or whatever the case is. But mortality goes up as you drop down. I think the lowest creatinine I've ever seen was a patient I saw here in residency who had uh, spinal muscular atrophy and had an undetectable creatinine level, zero, because she had effectively no, no lean body mass. And uh, her estimated GFR was fantastic. <laughs> we could give her all the bank we wanted, right? But that was obviously not reflective of her actual renal function because of this confounder. So beware, I point out low creatinines, we see them in our cirrhotics and our uh, uh, CKD patients all, very frequently, patient will come in with a creatinine of 0.2 and I immediately point that out and I identify that as a risk factor for this patient's mortality. Here are some uh, histopathologic images of, of skeletal muscle that have been biopsied in the setting of critical illness. Uh, for example, anybody here who's been through the ICU or plans to work in the ICU in the future, this is day one and day seven of critical illness. And there's substantial muscle necrosis going on there, huge inflammatory infiltrate. And when we actually measure um, the skeletal mass that's going on, we see that patients can lose upwards of 20% of their skeletal muscle mass within the first seven to 10 days of illness, like a lot. So it's very early and it's very rapid loss of skeletal muscle mass that we see in the setting of critical illness, which we deal with every single day. When we break this down and we look at it by how many organ systems are failing, because we also see single or multi-system organ failure, you can see it just traces itself out. The more organ systems go down, the more muscle mass you lose. Then you're starting to approach 30, sometimes even getting closer to 40% of your skeletal muscle mass in the first week, almost, of, uh, of critical illness. That's really bad, really bad. And so we all say, okay, so we just you know get, get a PT consult, send them, to, send them to the sniff, right? And it turns out that over two thirds of those patients are discharged from the post-acute rehab below their pre-hospitalization level of function. Right, so they come in, they have this huge, early, rapid hit, they lose tons of muscle mass, they lose tons of function. We get them through their acute hospitalization, we send them to rehab, they go through that, they stay there weeks, for example, and they still leave wor worse than they were before they ever got sick, right? So this is not a good thing. Not only that, but it's been estimated that 95% of the time spent in the hospital is effectively sedentary, right? 5% or less, and you all probably also recognize this, right? Most patients are in bed most of the time unless they've been swept off to some sort of a procedure or when PT is available to see them. Most hospitals, including probably here and probably where I work and probably other places, are understaffed with PT. They're not able to spend uh, probably adequate time with patients. They have huge numbers of consults to see. And so that's just not enough, right? Consider what I talked about with anabolic resistance. How much physical activity, what kind of dose of anabolic stimuli do these patients need? They need more. Right? And this is just woefully inadequate to really accomplish very much. And that's kind of what plays out when we see how these patients end up doing longer term. So how do we identify and find cases of sarcopenia? Well, there's a bunch of validated metrics and tools used in the research literature. Um, this is an example, it's called the SARC-F screen. And this is not something I necessarily expect anybody in here is gonna sweep up and start using on a daily basis because I know how daily practice works. This is something that's used more in the research literature. And while it's been proposed, you can see these questions, right? These are like kind of common sense questions. These are things that you can just get from a patient through conversation. Sometimes you can even just get it by like looking at them. You know, you just like watch them ambulate to the bathroom and you can probably tell how they're doing from a physical function standpoint. You don't necessarily, in day-to-day -day practice when you're identifying this stuff, you don't necessarily need to use uh, some sort of formalized tool, uh, at least at this point, based on the available evidence that we have. Um, so a few other kind of practical uh, ways to screen. You guys may be familiar with your timed up and go test, which a lot of a lot of places do as part of their Medicare screenings, for example. The just measuring gait speed. So, for example, if in your uh, primary care clinic you had uh, you had four meters uh, length marked off on the floor, maybe while they're walking back to the patient room, and you just time them how long it takes to get across those four meters, that'd be a pretty quick and easy test. It takes five seconds, and it's built into your workflow already. I like this one quite a bit, and this is one that I do use in the hospital a lot when I'm seeing inpatients or sometimes even in clinic, just say, hey, can you put your arms across your chest, stand up and sit back down five times as quickly as you can, right? And technically there's research on validating this cutoff. Is it 13 seconds? Is it 15 seconds? Again, I kind of eyeball it, right? If they look weak, 
right? Then I have enough reason to say, hey, like, we need to do something about this, right? And the nice thing about this is that if they do, in fact, appear to have difficulty executing the task, that itself can become their first exercise intervention, right? So if they struggle with it, let's say they can't get up at all without using their arms. Then I say, can you do it with your arms? And then maybe they can get up out of the chair, helping to push off with their arms. I'm like, okay. So by the time, next time I see you, I'd like for you to be able to do five reps with your arms, or maybe 10 reps with your arms, or maybe five reps with your arms and maybe do one without it, and find some way to progress it to the point where they can actually execute the test. So the test itself becomes the exercise. You just taught them how to do it. Pretty quick, pretty easy. And remember in the beginning I said that there's low muscle strength and there's low muscle mass, and technically, again, in the research world, they say that you should confirm it with measuring skeletal muscle mass by DEXA, I don't necessarily care about that myself. I don't do that in practice. If they're getting a DEX already, then I might take a look at that metric, but this is just for completeness sake. I don't think you need to be doing this. More of a functional assessment with these patients is much more useful in my opinion. Okay, so what can we do about this condition? We want to just tilt the balance the other way, right? So the problem previously was muscle protein breakdown, outweighing synthesis, net catabolism. We want to tilt the balance in the other direction. So we go back to our known criteria. We want to emphasize these guys. Not only do we want to emphasize them, but we want to make sure that we're not shooting ourselves in the foot by failing to address anything on that side, right? So you want to minimize the things that are going on on that side and maximize what's going on here. So if somebody has a chronic inflammatory disease, you should treat that, right? That untreated, uncontrolled lupus or RA or you know some, uh, uh, some other condition that can be treated to reduce the amount of systemic inflammatory uh, a process is going on, then you should do that. If somebody has chronic hypoxia from their COPD, for example, just get them on oxygen. That can help significantly. Um, if they're on glucocorticoids, get them on the lowest dose possible. Get them on every other day dose and get them off if you can, right? Those are all things that would be pulling things in the wrong direction. So minimizing stuff on the catabolism side and then maximizing things here. So what specifically do we need to know about maximizing the anabolic stimuli? So we'll start with the dietary protein piece. WHO's uh, recommendation suggests that 0.8 grams per kilo per day of dietary protein is sufficient for all individuals. And this is one of those RDAs that's set up to avert deficiency in like 97% of people. That's a very different thing than optimizing outcomes, right? And in fact, the data where this came from, only one of the papers used in the analysis that uh, came up with this guideline, only one of them actually included any older patients. So it says, turns out that this is not enough. And we have growing literature evidence base on this topic as well. It also doesn't account for anabolic resistance. So people who have those factors of inactivity, older age, medical conditions that make them less sensitive to where maybe 0.8 doesn't do anything for them and they need a higher dose. And it doesn't account for protein quality. And protein quality refers to the presence of all the necessary amino acids in the, uh, in the protein source to actually stimulate that anabolic response, where plant-based sources tend to do a little bit worse job of that than animal-based sources. So we have multiple lines of evidence that have bumped this recommendation up to somewhere between 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilo per day of dietary protein. Um, and in cases of severe, more severe anabolic resistance, you may even need to go even higher, which is uh, which, which probably sounds scary to a lot of people. We'll talk about why in a minute. So this paper actually just came out last week, uh, March 26th it looked like, and uh, basically they took 70 older women, I think this was set in Brazil, they were older than 60 years old, they put them on an eight week resistance training program. They were lifting weights three times a week uh, for eight weeks, so not a particularly long study to look at this stuff, right? And they stratified out these individuals based on their habitual dietary protein intake to low, medium, or high less than 0.77 grams per kilo, remember, compared to that WHO recommendation of 0 0.8, 0.77 to one, and greater than one. And here's what they saw. Skeletal muscle mass gain, you see this just almost linear response as uh, their, their habitual dietary protein intake increased, same with their strength gain as measured by one repetition maximum on three separate exercises in the study. And the high compared to the low, all of these were statistically significant in this paper. And again, I will point out, even if these numbers look small, this is an eight week study, right? That's a short intervention. So most of us would be hoping that our patients would, if we can get them to engage in this activity, uh, that we could be doing this over a longer period of time and get bigger effects out of it. So what about harms and contraindications? Because that may be running through some of your heads right now, right? We've all heard in the lay media, people talking about 
don't eat too much protein, don't take a, a protein supplement because it's bad for your kidneys or bad for your liver or bad for whatever. There's, this has actually been studied up to 4.4 grams per kilo per day, right? That's like four times what we're recommending, an enormous amount of dietary protein. So uh, based on my body weight, uh, I mean, that's, yeah, that's like all approaching 400 grams of protein a day or something like that, like an enormous amount. Uh, no evidence of harm to uh, hepatorenal function in individuals, even consuming very, very high amounts of dietary protein over the long term. This is, again, in healthy individuals, no harm. Of course, the question becomes, what about patients with chronic kidney disease, because we're all concerned about worsening their chronic kidney disease. The way I frame this is thinking about why are we doing a pro why would we recommend a protein-restricted diet in this individual? The typical response is going to be because we, want, we don't want to accelerate the decline in kidney function. Okay, so let's think about that for a second from the, from the viewpoint that putting somebody on a protein-restricted diet is itself an intervention that has this purported benefit as well as risks and costs, right? So consider that if you put somebody on a protein-restricted diet and you prevent their GFR from decreasing from, say, 60 to 50 or 45, but in the process, you make them sarcopenic. How did that risk-benefit balance actually play out in the real world? Not favorably, not favorably. So I think the patient context in terms of where their renal function is now and what you expect their trajectory will be over time should play a huge role in this, right? So if somebody's at 20 and you're worried about tipping them over into needing dialysis, then I, you know, I think that's probably a reasonable, thing to, a reasonable argument to make. If they're, if they're CKD2 or, or early CKD3 and you're like, if you do this, you're going to end up on dialysis, I mean, I don't think you have the evidence to support a claim like that. So you have to consider the risks of such an intervention. If you do end up needing to recommend this for such a reason, we have evidence that in that situation, resistance training becomes even more important. This paper I've cited here in the Annals of Internal Medicine made the argument that resistance training in these patients with CKD or ESRD can almost entirely mitigate the negative effects of putting these patients on a protein-restricted diet. So exercise becomes even more important for these individuals. We have evidence uh, on resistance training, both intra-dialysis, so they're actually exercising while they're receiving dialysis. There's evidence on inter-dialytic exercise between dialysis sessions. This is, again, for ESRD patients and CKD. There's even less to worry about from that standpoint, right? So exercise is even more important for these individuals. What about chronic liver disease? That's another one where people are concerned about, oh, the nitrogen load of dietary protein is going to hit their gut, it's going to precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. Yeah, that used to be the way we think about this. Turns out it doesn't play out that way. Actually putting these patients on protein-restricted diet dramatically worsens outcomes. They actually seem to have more encephalopathy when they're in a situation. They get more cachectic, more frail, more functional decline, higher mortality. So the guidelines have gotten rid of that idea of protein restriction for these patients with cirrhosis entirely. You'll see the guidelines now are kind of in line with the same guidelines for regular healthy people, say in that 1.2 to 1.6 gram per kilo per day range. All that makes sense to you? Those are the main situations. Of course, if somebody has some weird inborn error of metabolism that influences their dietary protein picture, that's like a rare situation that, you know, outside of this, the scope of this. But chronic kidney, chronic liver is a topic that comes up frequently. Uh, with this topic. I'll, can I get to you at the end? Yeah, sure. I just want to get through the text. So the other piece with respect to feeding is uh, continuous protein feeding, which we do in the hospital when we put people on tube feeds, right? For example, like in the ICU versus intermittent bolus feeding. This is a diagram showing muscle protein synthesis rates during continuous amino acid infusion while people are being fed continuously. And you see that the rates transiently increase and then they return back to baseline despite continued feeding. There appears to be this refractory period to continued feedings. This is thought to be just because, hey, physiologically, we tend to just eat bolus meals throughout the day. And so when these feedings are withdrawn, you give them about three hours to get through that refractory period and you start feeding them again, you see a new muscle protein synthetic response. So based on this kind of physiologic reasoning, there's increasing talks about uh, uh, whether intermittent versus continuous feeding in ICU or hospitalized settings can improve outcomes with respect to anabolism, for example. Um, and this is, in terms of uh, 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 kind of human clinical trials, is still kind of uh, in the works. And actually, I might, I'm going to be getting involved in something like that over across town where we're going to be looking at kind of those outcomes in uh, medical ICU patients. So that was the whole dietary protein piece. Now, arguably, even more importantly, is the need for muscular contraction, right, versus just remaining bedridden. 
Now, the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, cited here, just came out this past year. Most people are pretty aware of or familiar with the concept that, hey, some aerobic activity, some conditioning is good for people, right? But less recognized is that resistance training at least two to three days per week is part of the physical activity guidelines, that this should be recommended to everybody alongside that. Um, and you can, just looking at these, you can probably figure how many people tend to meet these guidelines, right? Not very many. Uh, or at least the people who do meet them tend to not be the types of people that you all see, right? Um, so the specific strength training recommendations look like this. The, the most important part, I care less about the stuff at the top because you can do any sort of resistance training program for an individual and if it is progressively overloaded, then I'm okay with it. If it is not, for example, if you keep doing the same exact thing, the same exact resistance, the same exact sets, the same exact reps, for example, you're going to see very limited and not long-term improvements out of that sort of thing. So if you're somebody who likes a certain type of exercise modality, cool, do it. It needs to be overloaded. And this is where most people tend to fall short is that, oh, stuff gets hard, right? So it has to be overloaded. And when you see a lot of the interventions, you know, uh, that are seen, that are that are recommended by certain types of healthcare professionals, by you know, say doctors, by physical therapists. A lot of them are just entirely too conservative, right? Your patient comes into the clinic. If you're a, if you're a good doctor, you'll say, hey, what do you do for exercise on a regular basis? And then the patient says, oh, you know, I, I walk to my mailbox and back, right? And then you say, okay, this patient's active. No, not only are they not active, but there is no progressive overload there. Oh, or they say, yes, I, I I'm uh, very active. I like to garden. No, gardening is not exercise. No, you're like physically moving your limbs around in a very short range of motion, digging little holes for your plants, but not exercise. So I have a higher standard for this kind of stuff and it should be your responsibility not to just take that answer and say, yeah, they move around a little bit, but to push them to actually increase that and to some extent. And in fact, we have uh, enormous data sets uh, indicating that progressive resistance training is an effective intervention for improving physical functioning. Now, of course, when I look at this, I see some of these changes and I'm like not super impressed by them on the whole, but you'll see that there's 121 trials in here and they are enormously heterogeneous interventions that are done, right? And some of the interventions that are done in the, in the studies on this, again, I would classify as crap interventions with inadequate overload in order to actually elicit a physiologic response. Not only that, but they may be underdosed for patients who are anabolically resistant and need a higher dose, right? And then what are you gonna get? You're gonna get a false negative study telling you that this intervention does nothing, when really if you just up the dose a little bit, you may see the response you're looking for. So we have this uh, data set of over 30,000 individuals that those who actually met the guidelines had a 46% lower odds of mortality, even controlling for all these other factors. And this was self-reported stuff too, right? Which most of you probably say, yeah, they're probably still not meeting the guidelines. But even in that situation, if they're doing any part of it, uh, they're getting a substantial benefit. And so from this, we conclude that even small increases provide a lot of benefits. There's no minimum threshold for where you can get benefit on this. And there is a dose response for exercise volume. This has been shown repeatedly over and over and over. The more, the greater the volume of exercise that you do, the greater the health benefits that you see with you know, within, you know, outside of the context of like training for elite sport, right? Where you might start to see a, a, a fall off on the other end of training more and more and more, but within the realm of regular people exercising, we have we don't really see that very much. So getting them to exercise as much as possible is gonna get them a dose response effect. And in fact, the American Physical Therapy Association as part of their choosing, their one of their five choosing wisely recommendations specifically says that uh, older adults are often prescribed low dose exercise and physical activity that are physiologically inadequate to increase gains in muscle strength. So they recognize this, and it's part of their choosing wisely guidelines, that do not prescribe underdosed programs because you're gonna get little effect from it. They need to be dosed higher. So when we look at data on actual adherence, this is the amount of exercise. This is again more of the, you know, when you track it in minutes, it's more like the aerobic or conditioning based activities. This is what they self report. Let's say that we actually attach an accelerometer to these individuals and track how much are they actually moving around. Pretty bad, pretty bad, right? This is the same phenomenon we see with people with respect to their dietary intake. People tend to underestimate uh, how many calories they're taking in. They tend to overestimate their energy expenditure. 
right? This is just kind of a human nature type thing. So this is what we see. Uh, far, far, far less than they think they're doing. Um, and then in the primary care setting with counseling, this is way back in, 20, in 1998, and they found that among this uh, cohort of, of primary care residents and, uh, and attendings, that only 12% were familiar with those recommendations that I showed at all. This is like pretty abysmal, right? And in 2018, they resurveyed a different group of PCPs about their patients who had cardiovascular risk factors, and they said that maybe just a little over half actually counseled them on doing any kind of exercise. And in, in a way, we were talking about this a little bit before I started, I can almost understand where these people are coming from, right? Because they see so many of the type of patient who maybe is not interested or unwilling to engage or something like that, and you get this kind of jaded attitude about it, you say, oh, well, nobody's gonna exercise. I don't necessarily think that's the case, right? Because we still talk to our patients about smoking cessation. And we know that we're not gonna be able to save every single one of them or get every single one of them to quit, but we still recognize that this is such a huge risk factor that we should at least bring it up. And they say bring it up every time you see this patient, right? Hammer it over and over and over again, reassess where they are in their, you know, in their readiness to change and start encouraging them and pushing them and offering resources and things like that. And I view it as a number needed to treat. Let's say that one doctor with their counseling skills, their motivational interviewing skills, they have an NNT of 100 for getting somebody to quit smoking, right? Out of every 100 patients, they can get one to quit, right? Still worth doing, right? Because it's a more potent effect than we get from certain medications that we prescribe, for example. I view this the same way, right? You're gonna counsel, you should be counseling everybody, a large number of patients, and you're gonna capture a fraction of them and keep working on the others and pushing them along in those kind of stages of change type model. Uh, so that's the way I view this, rather than just dismissing and saying, well, nobody's gonna do this, so I shouldn't even bring it up. Because based on the data I showed at the beginning, you'd have a hard time justifying that, based on how important this is. So that brings us to these barriers. What's stopping us and what's stopping our patients from doing this stuff? Well, counts, uh, uh, surveys of physicians said that lack of knowledge or training in physical activity counseling is part of it. So for example, not being aware of what the guidelines are, what you should be recommending to patients, how to do it, the whole motivational interviewing piece that I think that everybody, that you guys all get trained in, for example. The idea that physical activity counseling is not a priority or not relevant, hopefully I have dispelled that, uh, that myth here. And then here, not enough evidence of benefits of physical activity. That one is surprising to me. I put the arrows here because these are the main ones that I can potentially modify here today, right? I can't modify the lack of time, unfortunately. That's like the suits have to modify that kind of thing for you, right? So the idea that, again, my patients will never exercise. Well, we have strong evidence that you can actually influence patient behavior, especially when interventions are based on behavioral change theories and techniques. There are multiple evidence-based approaches to how to influence behavior change when you use those approaches. Strong evidence that you can actually influence patient behavior. And if your expectation is that you're gonna suddenly get everybody to do it, then you're the one with the problem because you have unrealistic expectations, right? So you don't wanna get burned out from that standpoint. Real expectations need to be reasonable here. So what are some factors on the patient or the individual side that are associated with their likelihood to engage in resistance training in particular? This isn't just exercise in general, but resistance training in particular is their level of education, higher education levels, somewhere between 1.7 to 2.5 times more likely to engage in resistance training. Perceived health status, if you ask them, how do you feel your health is? Somebody says they feel their health is good, they're more likely to participate, right? And you can see, you know, imagine the kind of patient who would tell you no, I'm not very healthy at all, right? People who recognize that about themselves, they're less likely to engage in numerous health-promoting behaviors. Um, affective judgments, how somebody feels about exercise, how they expect it is going to feel. Is it going to be enjoyable? Is it going to be horribly unpleasant? That is a fork in the road where people either choose to engage or they don't choose to engage. Their level of self-efficacy, if they feel some uh, internal control over their health status, over what they can do, over what they can accomplish, versus needing somebody else to do everything for them, needing a doctor to fix them, needing a therapist to fix them, versus they have the capability to engage in this process and do something about it themselves. That's, this is probably the biggest thing that I try to promote in my practice, is self-efficacy, trying to get patients you know, more engaged with their own health and trying to get them to take charge of it, rather than being passive recipients of what I'm doing to them. Um, Self-regulation behaviors, this is stuff like goal setting, tracking your progress, uh, planning things out, things like that. Those are behaviors that would tend to predict the type of person who is going to be more likely to engage. And then program leadership or guidance, for example, a coach or somebody who's kind of guiding the process uh, through, through an exercise intervention. 
And then this question, this this line we get all the time from patients, right? But doc, I'm so I'm, I'm active at my job. I work construction. I work some very physically demanding job. There is this very bizarre but very fascinating body of literature on why occupational physical activity does not appear to give the same benefits that you would expect compared to leisure time physical activity. We do not fully understand the mechanism of how this happens in terms of cardiovascular uh, uh, risk factors and why physical activity in one context might not give the same sorts of benefits as the other. There's probably, you know, taking a big biopsychosocial view of the human, there's probably some other contextual factors that may influence that. Maybe performing that uh, occupational activity in a very, maybe in a very stressful environment at work or something like that, maybe mitigates the cardiovascular benefit that you would get out of it compared to leisure time. I don't really know and neither does anybody else, but all I'm saying is that that's not a sufficient answer. If somebody says I'm very active in my job, sorry, right? And then there's no evidence in my patient population. Everybody likes to think that they have some super special, very unique, particularly difficult patient population, right? So, <laughs> yes, their patients are all snowflakes, and those patients, those, you know, we don't have evidence on that. So hypertension, substantially reduced mortality for those in the highest strength per child, CHF, Peripheral arterial disease, those who had the lowest, uh, the quartile of knee flexion strength had an over 4.2 times mortality uh, risk. Chronic kidney disease, where strength is an independent predictor of mortality. COPD, where quadricep strength predicts mortality better than FEV1, an underappreciated fact about these people. Rheumatoid arthritis, critical illness, Surgical patients, predict, in terms of predicting post-op complications, we have this, I mean, I, this slide, I could make many slides about this. For every unique patient population that you can think of has been studied in Parkinson's and stroke patients and cancer patients and everything you can think of. And so, in fact, I was asked, along with two of my colleagues, to write an article on this topic that's now been published on Up to Date, as well as a follow-up article on how to actually implement this stuff. So in this article, we review the evidence on uh, resistance training uh, in particular for numerous common health conditions related to cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, liver, lung. I basically went through internal medicine, differential diagnosis style, picked out the most common things we see, and then re reviewed the evidence, put it together into this article, which is now published. And if you have any interest in this topic, or if you have a question about, hey, what's the evidence look like for this patient population that I take care of? Maybe on there. If it's not on there, it's probably on PubMed. As I said, these are all conditions that we have evidence in, among many others. Uh, and the take home points would be the skeletal muscle strength matters. The sick patients that you and I take care of lose a whole lot of muscle. The usual care that is delivered to these patients, whether it's by us or whether it's by physical therapists or whether it's by post acute rehab folks, et cetera, is underdosed. It's underdosed, and we don't get as good of outcomes as we, as we might otherwise be able to accomplish. Uh, we can actually influence patient behavior if we follow those evidence-based kind of models of behavior change and how to, how to, how to do that. And promoting self-efficacy in your patients to actually take charge of this is important because if they feel like they always need somebody else to fix them, then they're never going to engage in this process at all. So that would be my recommendations on this. I think that's everything I have. Thank you. Thanks.